I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how to calculate linkage map units in genetics. So we were talking today about how to determine what a recombinant organism was. So the first thing we're going to do is look at this problem in Mastering Biology. This is um, chapter 15 and it's item number 6 in your homework. Um, you can see the problem here on the right. If two genes are found on different chromosomes or if they are far enough apart on the same chromosome, that the chance of a crossover between them is very high, then the genes are considered to be unlinked, and these are Mendelian genes. However, if the two genes are traveling together because they're on the same chromosome or close to one another, they are said to be linked, and they do not follow the law of independent assortment. So what we have done already in class today is we looked at these tomato plants and their traits. Um, the solid leaves are the uh, dominant trait or the wild type, normal height and smooth skin, and then the recessive traits are the mottled leaves, the dwarf plant, and the peach skin. Um, so what we've done here, we already went through um, how to determine uh, basically the phenotypic and genotypic ratio. So I'm going to scroll all the way down here past all these things that we've already done. Part B is going to be important in just a second. So um, basically it's asking us, well, let me just scroll all the way down here. Suppose that we perform the cross discussed in Part B, and here it is that the heterozygous individual and the recessive individual. So we've planted a thousand tomato seeds and they result uh, with these individuals here on this table. So if you have 420 of them that look like um, a heterozygous individual and then various numbers of uh, variants and then at the bottom we have 416 of the recessive individual. So what I've done is I've kind of put all this together over here on the left into my own little table. So I've got my parental types. From the very beginning, we had a uh, homozygous dominant individual crossed with a recessive individual. And then after that, we decided to do a test cross. So, so the numbers we have here um, are the numbers resulting from the test cross. However, when we're talking about our parental types, we have to look back at the very beginning to the P generation, not the F1 generation. So when we're asking, okay, are these individuals recombinant or not, we're asking, do they look like a parental type or do they look like a recombinant type? Do they have the same phenotype as a parental or not? So what we're going to do here, we've set up a little table. We can't uh, look at all three genes at the same time. So we're going to look at each one um, as a pair. So the first thing we're going to do is, okay, for the, for the locus M and D, do we have any recombinants? Now, these guys look like one of the parents, or both, but in this case, they look like one parent, so we can't call them a recombinant. Um, so what we've got to do is go all the way down this whole first column and determine who the recombinants are of our, of our offspring here, our progeny. So what we've got, um, a recombinant here, 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 and here. These guys do not look like a parent for those two loci, the M and the D. All right, so they don't have, um, they either have mottled skin and then they don't have the other trait, or um, they don't have the mottled skin and they do have the other trait. So, for example, this one has the mottled skin, but it is a dwarf. And we don't have a parent that has mottled skin and is a dwarf. We have a parent that's mottled and tall, and we have a parent that is, um, I'm sorry, a solid and tall, and then we have a mottled and dwarf, but we don't have one that's um, solid and dwarf, if that makes any sense. Okay, so that's how we determine. This one is um, the solid leaf and a dwarf also. This one has the mottled leaf, but is normal height or tall. And then this one also has the, the mottled leaf and is tall. So that's why those are the recombinants. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in the chart for all of these. And this is something you can also do at home. this one. Okay, and then our last column, we're looking at the D and the P locus. So is it a dwarf or not? And is it have the smooth skin or the peach skin on the tomato plant, tomato fruit? So these guys are recombinants. There's the bell. Time for me to go home. Just kidding. And then this one is a recombinant. And this is a recombinant. Okay, so now we know who our recombinants are. What we're going to do is we're going to add up how many progeny do we have for the recombinants in the first column. So I'm going to do some math. 
I got my trusty calculator that you can't see, 2 plus 52 plus 62 plus 4 gives me 120. And then the next column, 21, 52, 62, 23, which is 158. Oops, 158. And then the last one, 21, 2, 4, and 23. And that's 50. All right, so now we know how many of each um, group are recombinants. So what we do now is determine the recombination frequency or how often do we see those recombinants in the progeny. So I'm actually going to do the math right here on Excel. Sorry, 120 into 1,000 is 12%. 158 into 1,000 says 1,000 is our total number of offspring. And then 50 times 1,000. 5%. All right, now I'm going to scroll down over here on the right into our map. You can see that I've already filled this in, um, but if you, if you couldn't see that, what we're going to look at over here, these three numbers, we have to determine the order in which the genes appear. So since this 15.8%, this is the biggest gap between M and P, that's telling us that the D locus would be between the two, with the D being closer to P and the M being closer on the other end. So if you scroll down over here, you can see M is furthest away from P, is D being between. And then, of course, um, if you add 12 and 5 together, you get about 17. That's not 15.8% exactly, but um, as you have learned, the map units are not precise measurements, but they're intended to be there to give you a general idea of how far apart the genes are. So that's how we do the math behind um, drawing this map. And then I'm going to scroll down so you can see the explanation here. And you can see that if two genes are close together on the chromosome, crossing over between those two genes would be rare. So we would find them um, together in an organism more frequently than if they were farther apart. Also, something to note is that if the, uh, if the two genes are very close to the center here, it's likely that they won't cross over at all because the centromere is very uh, controlled and, and everything that's close to the middle uh, usually sticks right there and doesn't go anywhere else. So I hope that helps explain to you how to do this linkage map. We'll be doing some more examples of this in class when I see you again. Y'all have a good night and see you next time.